When we come to the question, then, we make sure that we straighten the question out and remove the obstacles within the question itself. Because many times people say something in the question that's not correct. So before we begin to answer a question, we analyze the question and remove the things which are not true or influence the statement in such a way that there's no way you can really answer it from the standpoint of Islam. The next thing we do is explain to them that the answers to questions in Islam provide more than just a little bit of understanding. They give us direction and understanding of who is our creator and what our purpose of life is. So that when they're at the end of the answer to the question, it should be that they realize that this, the impact of this answer on them should have a profound effect. And we should ask them, are you going to be prepared at the end of the answer to this question, if you hear things that you like, if you see things here that are things that you say, well, this is something good for me, I'd like that to be a part of my life, then are you going to be prepared to consider worshiping your Lord alone without any partners? Because you see, that's what Islam is really all about. Now we'll come back to this question that we've been talking about. Why can a man have four wives and a woman can only have one husband? I want to give you a little something that happened to me one time at a university. A woman stood up, an elderly woman, rather large uh, woman. She said, uh, I want to know something. How come you Muslim men can have four wives and a woman can only have one husband? I said, excuse me, ma'am, are you married? She said, yeah. I said, okay, why don't you do this? Right now, I want you to imagine your husband. She said, why? I said, no, just, just for a minute. Imagine your husband. He's coming home from work, right? He comes to his favorite chair, sit down, relax. You have to serve him, take care of him, all so and so. You just get this guy in your mind, okay? Just imagine him. She said, and? I said, you got him in your mind? She said, yeah. I said, okay, how would you like to have another one just like him? She said, no way. I said, well, then why do you want four? <laughs> but this really is not the best answer for them. I'll tell you why. Because this isn't the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu would have answered the question. It's a very direct question. It needs a direct answer. The reason in Islam for the four wives is not for the man as much as it is for the woman. And you have to understand that Islam is not just about what I want, but it's also about what you want. So there are rights and there are limits. Everybody has their rights, but there are limits. Let me explain. Islam forbids a man to marry a woman who's already married. You must choose women who are not married. And you must choose from women who are old enough to make the decision. It isn't permissible to marry a girl without her consent. And she can't give it if she's not old enough. So this is part of the verse when saying not to marry these little girls, these little orphan girls. But rather marry who? Women of your choice who are able to decide for themselves that they'd like to get married. But look at the decision they get to make. Because we're going to turn it upside down and we're going to analyze this for a minute. A man is not allowed to marry women who are already married. He's also not allowed to marry more than four. The companions of Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were not enthused about this verse coming in the, from the aspect that, oh wow, you know, I can go out and get a bunch of wives, because they already had that. There was no limit for them. They could do that. In fact, they had to get rid of some of their wives. They had to divorce wives if they had more than four. And they had to divorce even more than that if they couldn't treat them fairly. So if they were not able to provide for them on an equal basis, then they could only marry one. Now, the woman on the other hand, and by the way, there's always been more women than men. You can go through the annals of history and you'll notice that there's always more women on earth than there are men at any given point in time, especially these days. A woman has the right to choose any man she would like unless he already has four wives. So this opens up a very big selection for her. She can observe how he treats his other wives. And if he's a good, kind, generous, and religious man, and she said, well, I like this guy. Look how he's treating this sister over here. I think that this is the way I would like to be treated. So you know what? i tell you what. I'm going to choose this guy to be my husband. Now, if you said, well, I don't like that idea. Well, you, nobody's forcing you. In fact, the man's not forced to have four wives. A woman is not forced to be in a situation where there are four wives. For the most part, if we look at the Muslims today, we find that that's not the case anyway. 
The big thing here isn't about the number of wives. The big thing here is that there is absolutely, emphatically, always the insistence that there be no sex outside of marriage. So the emphasis is on the contract of marriage. A man in the West can have as many girlfriends, mistresses, as he would like. No problem. But yet they'll limit him to only one wife. If he has a child out of wedlock, a lot of these guys escape from that. They don't even take care of the child financially. You have to make man-made laws to take care of the problem that comes out of these men having these extramarital affairs. And there's really nothing to stop him from doing this. There's no real law out there that says a man can't have girlfriends. But there is in Islam. It's very clear. If you would like to have a relationship, and this is encouraged in Islam, it's only with your own wife. And you can only have one unless you can treat them with equal fairness. Then you could have two, or three, or four, but that's the limit. What that does for the woman. Stop and think about it. Here is a man who can only choose from the unmarried women. If there were only two left in the village, that's the only two he could change, char it. That's the only two that he could choose from. But in the case of the woman, even if they were all married, she could still choose from those who don't have four wives. So there is something here of balance, of equal rights and equal opportunity. We don't want to present this as being something where it's just for men or just for women, but it's something that gives a balance. And it's from now until the end of the day of judgment. It's always there. And it's not from us. It's not from a man. And it's not from a woman. Who is it from? This is from the Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of the Worlds. And if you understood this, and you realize that, gee, this does sound pretty good, then I want you to consider this. Since the time of Muhammad wasallam, it has been always forbidden that a man have any sex outside of marriage. Whether he's married or unmarried, he can't do this. This has changed the way people live. This has changed society tremendously. Just this one particular thing. Saying that there has to be marriage and there must be a contract. There must be responsibility taken in any relationship between a man and a woman. Okay? The next thing that we look at is that in the Islamic countries, Muslim countries, even today, we find that the men and women of Islam are the most monogamous. They have the least number of extramarital affairs, if, it is, if you will. And also they have, for the most part, one wife. And not only that, they marry her and stay married to her until one or the other of them pass away. That's very common in Islam. In the Muslim countries, we find the least divorce rate. We find the least of the unwed mothers and children born without parents, without father and mother being married. What we find in the Islamic countries or Muslim countries is that there is a family, a wholesome family, and what that is about, a man and a woman and their children growing together, staying together, and the purpose to be together is to please their Lord, not just to please themselves. This gives us now the opportunity to talk about the fact that this all came from who? From Allah. And Allah is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. This is something He has said. This is not a man-made law. In fact, Islam is not about man-made laws. It's about God's laws for His creation called the human being. And what He takes on one side, He balances on the other side. And so there is always a balance in Islam, as we've noticed with this particular question here, and the answer to it. Once we have understood and presented this the correct way, many times what we're going to find, you'd be amazed, the person's going to say, I didn't know that. Gee, this sounds good. Well, I like that for me. And when they start saying that, this is your opportunity to say what? Remember what we said in the beginning? If you hear something you like, and you say, gee, I like this for me, this is something that makes sense. Then are you going to be prepared to consider your life and worshiping your God alone without any partners? Because in fact, that's what Islam is all about. It's about doing what God wants, not what you want. It's not about following your lust and your desires. Islam is about pleasing Allah, doing things according to His will. This sums it up. And what this does is two things. First, as we said, it lifts the fog of confusion. It removes doubts and it gets rid of these misconceptions right away. 
But then it gives them a chance to reflect and think about what is my relationship with God? What, what am I doing with my Lord? And when they begin to reflect on that, that's our opportunity to say to them, you know, there really is only one God. One God. And what we want to do with our one God is worship Him on His terms. And that word in Arabic is Islam. So if you want to do what God wants you to do, you want God's will on earth as it is in heaven, essentially what are you saying? You're saying Islam. Islam. It's the slim. This is what Islam is about. Surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace with the Almighty. And really that's what Islam is about. So the person now has had a chance by the answer to the question to see Islam in a whole different picture because you've removed a lot of the confusion and as we say, lifted the fog. And that's what this series is about. We hope that you'll make dua for us to be able to continue this and that you'll also participate with us in lifting the fog and the misconceptions about Islam. Until next time, Sir Yusuf Estes reminding you it's only Allah that guides. So we pray for guidance for everybody. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.